Some are saying life as we knew it changed on October 7, 2023. What does that mean? Remember, it must have been about eight, nine years ago, the Ayatollah of Iran wrote a book and it said, we will annihilate Israel in 25 years. If history has taught us anything, it's when a madman speaks, you listen. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan spends the hour with Michelle Bachman. The mass slaughter on October 7th in southern Israel affected far more than Israeli society. A demonic spirit was unleashed that day upon the whole world. We hope the discussion this hour is informative and a reminder that the church age is wrapping up. The time of Jacob's trouble is on the horizon. Now, here is today's uninterrupted programming. Globally, I want to address this moment of peril for the Jewish people worldwide as we witness a disturbing spike in anti-Semitic hate speech and even instances of violence against Jews and Israelis following the October 7th massacre. Today, the National Security Council and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs put out an unusual global travel warning. We are calling on all citizens of Israel to exercise heightened caution when traveling anywhere abroad. We know that Jewish communities and their institutions, Israeli diplomatic missions and airports handling flights to and from Israel are key targets for anti-Semites and violent anti-Semites. The National Security Council is urging all Israelis to consider whether any foreign travel anywhere in the world is necessary at this dangerous moment. Citizens planning to travel to countries with specific travel warnings are asked to postpone their visits and we emphasize Arab and Middle Eastern states, the Northern Caucasus, and countries bordering Iran. We are also asking citizens, and truly I cannot believe that we are doing this, we are asking all citizens to avoid displaying any outward signs of their Israeli or Jewish identity when traveling anywhere in the world. If you must travel, please make sure that you have the numbers of emergency services and the local Israeli embassies on speed dial. Keep away from the anti-Israel pro-Jihad protests and remain alert and vigilant about your surroundings at all times. Welcome to the program. So glad you could join me for the hour. We now have seen six weeks of war in the Mideast, nations of the world aligning on one side or another, Jews hiding in hundreds of cities around the world, global leaders either denouncing God's covenant land or standing with it, calls for a ceasefire, hostage talks, and so much more. Many of us with platforms have tried to address this biblically, and certainly from the angle of eschatology or Bible prophecy, it has been analyzed politically. The topic as I speak is splitting churches. No surprise, as many will not take a side. Imagine a church that can thank the Jews for their Bible, for their Messiah, for the prophets of old, for the apostles, and more that will not stand up for Israel at her greatest hour of need since the Holocaust. But there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them in the Western world silent. I am hearing from more and more people every day, and I have addressed this in the last month. Today, we will hear from a program favorite, Michelle Bachman. Michelle actually went to Kibbutz Beri right after high school. She has been a longtime friend of Israel while serving in the Minnesota legislature and the U.S. House of Representatives. Since her departure from the House in 2015, she has been an outspoken advocate for Israel before that as well. She also is one of the leaders of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. Michelle and I have worked together for many years. We both headquarter out of the Twin Cities, although currently Michelle Bachman is dean of the Robertson School of Government at Regent University. We have a lot to talk about, limited time. The program's uninterrupted. Michelle, welcome back to the program. So great to be with you. Thanks, Jan. Michelle, I'm just intrigued. You were serving in Kibbutz Beri. That was the one that was ground zero for Hamas. I was actually a tourist in 1974. You were there at Beri. Your thoughts when you heard what had happened and ground zero, your former kibbutz, I know you were in France at the time. It was absolutely devastating. I got a call that morning from a friend who told me what happened in the south of Israel, and it was my kibbutz. That's where I lived. That's where I worked. I worked in the cotton fields picking weeds. We'd go out at 3.30 in the morning, come back at noon, and then start cleaning the dining room. So 
it wasn't glamorous work, but that's the work that we did. So we worked there, but also befriended people who lived at the kibbutz. For people who don't know what a kibbutz is, it's a village where Jewish people live, but they're committed for life to live there. And it usually centers around the occupation. Bari had a printing plant, but they also had agriculture, and their agriculture products have changed over the years. But of course, there were families. So Kibbutz Bari is a fairly large kibbutz, about 1,100 people today. I don't know if it was exactly that large back then, but during each day, one of my girlfriends and I would go over to the school where the children were educated, and we would just visit with the kids because they were learning to speak English. And so we had great relationships with those kids. So if you figure, that was back in 1974, those kids would probably be not only adults, they might even possibly have been grandparents because people lived there for their whole life. I went back in 2016 and I revisited Kibbutz Berry and had a marvelous experience. And I went to the dining room again to sit with the little kids. They were like four and five years old. And so when this happened, this slaughter, I had pictures on my phone of when I was visiting with those kids in the dining room. And I was just broken and struck because they suffered such utter devastation of a bloodbath at Kibbutz Berry. And those kids that I was eating with, I wondered how many are still alive? How many lost their parents? How many lost their brothers and sisters? How many were there for that moment? Because those kids would have been about 12 years old. And we know that many of the people in Bari were taken as hostages. They were on the little dirt bikes and they were brought across the border because Bari is only three miles from the Gaza border. So they were an easy target and they suffered utter devastation. If you look at it, it looks like a scene from World War II. It was bombed out, fired upon, and the devastation, the blood is everywhere. So I can't tell you how long it took me to deal with that and process what had happened to the people who were living there. When America is weak, it causes global catastrophes. And you and I were sharing a platform in August, it might have been September of 2021, at Jack Hibbs Church, and we had the Afghanistan catastrophe of weeks earlier. And we were saying at that time publicly, a weak America has caused a catastrophe in Afghanistan, and now it's happened again, of course, in the Middle East, which is just tragic that we have to be observing our instability in Washington. That's true, because we all remember when Joe Biden pulled the United States out of Afghanistan, he left the biggest military disaster we'd ever seen, where he left about $85 billion worth of the finest equipment for military use known to man on the desert floor. And he left the most strategic air base that is only about an hour away from China. It's Bagram Air Base. I'd been there multiple times as a member of Congress when I was on various trips. I was just shocked at what Joe Biden had done. And so he sent a signal purposely to the world that we had abandoned our allies. We weren't in there only the United States and Afghanistan. We had coalition partners. So there were Australians there, people from Canada. I mean, all these other countries were there working with the United States on this Afghanistan project. But we pulled out and we didn't even tell our allies. It is literally the worst pullout I've ever seen. But my opinion is that was done by design. It was meant to anger our allies and set on fire our enemies Mm -hmm. and then demonstrate to the world that we are led by people in the United States that don't know what time of day it is. That's literally the signal that was supposed to be sent. The people who want these outcomes, they want to have a Joe Biden as president, someone who clearly isn't in charge, who's causing destruction everywhere he goes. And so what that does is set the table. So you and I were at Jack Hibbs Church at an event, and he allowed me to have a few minutes up on stage. And that was the burden that God had put on my heart, that people needed to reconcile and understand that every day of our life when we grew up, We knew when we woke up in the morning, we lived in the greatest military and economic superpower on earth. Therefore, we had options. Therefore, we had a different standard of living. But what's happened, I don't say this to be partisan, what happened under Joe Biden, when he pulled out of Afghanistan, what he showed the world is that the United States of America is no longer the military superpower on earth, but the true fact is we're no longer the economic superpower on earth. And so the enemies across the world have gauged that. 
and they laid out their plans. The estimates are this current devastation took about two years right. to plan. That oh. takes you back to Afghanistan. That's exactly right. Michelle, you have talked extensively, I have too, about Middle East conflict here forever. And we both have pointed out that the root seems to be the indoctrination of children over there as young as two and three years old. And I'm just playing a quick clip. It happens to be you. You give a short history here going back to 2005, and then you talk about their little children Sesame Street in that part of the world is what's producing what we're seeing today. But in 2005, Israel gave the people of Gaza, 2005, gave them lock, stock, and barrel Gaza. It's yours, free and clear. Have a nice life. Leave us alone. On the way out, as the Jews were leading, leaving, literally the people of Gaza were shooting Jews in the back as they left their homes, they left their businesses, and so too it has continued to this day. This isn't just October 7th. This is almost every day for the life of Jews in Israel. Somebody's getting stabbed by a Palestinian. Someone gets shot by a Palestinian. Someone gets run over in a car by a Palestinian because there is this fervent hatred for the Jews. How do I know that? As a member of Congress, I read the textbooks that we're being taught to the Arab children in the Gaza and in the Palestinian Authority, the head of the Palestinian Authority. I took over an envelope. I sat across the table from him in Ramallah. I pushed it across the table. I said, are you still teaching your children to hate Jews in your schools? Oh, no, no. We gave that up a long time ago. Oh, really? I gave him the pages. These are your current textbooks that you're using. Also, they have PBS effectively in those areas, and their children have a Sesame Street and on this show, I've seen it myself, little three-year-olds with checkered scarves around their head, three-foot-long butcher knives saying, when I grow up, I'm going to kill Jews. So we need to know and understand. Parents teach this to their children, the neighbors that are surrounding Israel. And so what we saw happen on Saturday, October 7th, is a fulfillment of the Charter of Gaza is a fulfillment of what parents have been teaching their children in Gaza, in the Palestinian Authority, in the areas controlled by Hezbollah. It, but more than anything else, this demonic, bloody, brutal action that happened on October 7th is a fulfillment of the satanic, demonic promise of Satan that he is going to conquer God. He will not conquer God. He will not defeat God's covenant people. He will not defeat God's plan because God's strong right arm will have the final say. Read the book of Revelation. He will win and be victorious. Appreciated your comments there, Michelle. You want to follow up with any comment? I think the central piece that we should understand from that is that God's covenant is what is at stake right now. Satan is at war. These are the last days, the end times. And Satan knows that his time is short. But yet, isn't it interesting? He will not give up on what he began in the Garden of Eden, the destruction of man. And the covenant that God gave to Abraham was the redemption of mankind, bringing all people on earth back to himself. Satan hates that. Because Satan was so jealous, he wanted to be God. He hated God because he wanted to be God. We see evidence of that today. He's still trying to destroy the covenant. He won't succeed, but he's leaving a wide path of carnage. And so what these parents in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority are doing, it's real. I've seen it firsthand myself. They are brainwashing their children to hate Jews. That's the number one industry in Gaza. We're all told that these Palestinians are nice people. It's just that Hamas is bad. Well, there's been polling data, and the people living in Gaza hate Jews and agree with what Hamas has been doing. Michelle, both you and I have stated publicly that the world changed on October 7th. It'll probably never quite be the same again. We both agree that some sort of a spirit was unleashed on that day. Obviously, it's been active for centuries, certainly the last 100 years. And then something terrible was unleashed on that particular day. 
which I think is what we mean when we say that the world changed. But give me your perspective here, because I want my audience to hear your perspective on the eternal consequences of what happened that day. I woke up in Paris. I was headed back to the United States, and I got a call from southern Israel telling me what had happened. And three things happened, Jan. I had a punch to my gut. I literally felt it, that this was different than any other attack. And then the next thing that happened is that I sensed that a spirit had been unleashed upon the earth, a spirit of death, satanic spirit had been unleashed. And then the third thing is that the hinge of history is turned and there's no going back. We're in a different chapter. And that's when I thought this is end time prophetic linked because we're moving into not only just the intensity and the frequency of the birth pangs, we're now moving into a different chapter of these last days. That's why I believe that an evil that we have never experienced before has been unleashed upon the earth. And that's why we need to be aware. We've seen it in these six weeks since October 7th. We've felt the tension in our spirits. We have seen these actions, the protesters out on the street, people literally getting killed. And what are they doing? They are demanding and they're applauding a Holocaust against the Jewish people. So this isn't 75 years ago in a Warsaw ghetto. This is today, but it's every bit as much that same spirit seeking who to devour, who to kill, who's Jewish. So this is an irrational, unnatural hatred. And that's how you know it's satanic because Satan is trying to destroy God's covenant people because he's trying to destroy the covenant. And there's a saying among the Arab people who engage in this terrorism. They say, we're going to go after the Saturday people first, the Jews, then the Sunday people, the Christians. And so we shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that this is only about killing Jews. This is about killing Christians. This is about killing even Muslims who don't agree with Hamas. That's their goal. It's utterly depraved. I think some people are shocked at the outrage coming from our college campuses. Clearly unsafe for those who differ with the radical left, starting with the Jews. A hundred years of agitation on our campuses, I think, has borne a lot of fruit. But nonetheless, Michelle, I think this was hidden until October 7th. And I think the most shocking element to everyone in the free world has been the unleashing of campus hate that we never thought was possible. We have Jewish students hiding in closets, in cafeterias, hiding anywhere they can on our college campuses. And much of the world is laughing, thinking this is kind of a funny drama to watch. Give me your thoughts on this. Well, it is a belief system. Again, just to give you an example, there's polling data that was done after October 7th. And of those who live in Gaza, anywhere from 80 to 90 percent agree with what Hamas did. The same is true in the Palestinian Authority, Judea, Samaria. But also polling data was done in America of American Muslims. So this is not Islamophobic for me to say this. What I'm giving you is polling data of American Muslims, 57 percent agreed with what Hamas did. Now, remember, before the year 2000, there was a de minimis population of Muslims living in the United States. We didn't have a lot of problems with Muslims living in the United States. We had the world trade bombing in 1993 with the coal bombing. So there were some Muslims here. There had been terrorist acts that were vile and terrible, but we didn't see this level of protest. What's happened is we've had massive immigration of Islamic fundamentalists, Islamic supremacists who believe that Islam must dominate, they've brought that deadly hatred into the United States. And they have an agenda. They intend to conquer the United States for Islam. On college campuses, what you're seeing is something we didn't have before. We didn't have an Islamic population in these level of numbers, but this is the fruit of this unbridled immigration. Isn't it interesting? These young kids who come from around the world to the United States where they have an opportunity to get a first class education and live in the United States of America and build themselves up into a career. What do they want more than anything? It's a blood lust hatred to kill Jews. And the dirty secret is to kill us. They are audacious. They're arrogant. I've seen it. I've interacted with them. 
because they come with a belief they're going to win. So when we don't push back and force them to have to abide by our laws, if people remember the protest in front of the White House when they took red hands and put it all over the White House gate, they were scaling the gates. The guards did nothing. They were defacing even the White House public property. The guards did nothing. When we do nothing and allow these people to get away with this in public, all this means is we're going to have more of it, and they are winning. So we've got to get a brain and make sure that we uphold our standards in the United States. Wherever you come from in the world, you need to abide by our laws. If you join me late, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Mark Hill. have with me for the hour a familiar voice of Michelle Bachman. She served Minnesota's 6th District from 2007 to 2015. And by the way, she's currently the dean of the Robertson School of Government, and that would be at Regent University in Virginia. Just a couple of quick comments. Saturday, November 18th, is the Pastor Brandon Holthouse Conference, The Truth About Israel in Bakersfield, California, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Go to rockharborchurch.net. Sign up for the live stream. Brandon Holthouse, Billy Crone, Tom Hughes, David Tall, Bill Koenig, and Olivier Melnick, rockharborchurch.net. Small live stream costs, but all proceeds go to the needs in Israel. Again, Saturday, November 18th, 9 to 5 Pacific Time in Bakersfield. And say, Olive Tree wants to help you become a watchman on the wall in these dark times. Check out our website, olivetreeviews.org, for articles updated hourly. You can also sign up for our e-newsletter, which is a couple times a month, and our print quarterly magazine. And in these times, you know, it's nice to talk to other believers and be encouraged by them. Check out our social media, Truth Social, Facebook, Gab, Twitter, or X, Telegram, and Instagram. Michelle, I was listening to Melanie Phillips, and she was addressing our topic for the hour is the crisis in the Mideast and how that's affecting literally the whole world and the church, by the way. She's addressing the kumbaya of the left. Obviously, the Democrats, anybody on the left has wanted to appease. There's a kumbaya mindset within them, and we can all get along with just everybody. Well, no, we can't. Let me play a quick clip of Melanie and then come back and talk about it. We can all see that American, uh, that the Biden administration has sent an enormous amount of firepower into the Middle East, for which Israel is extremely grateful. And we can see it's already been in some limited action. But I'm afraid to say among Israelis, the signals are considered very ambiguous. Uh, is the American fleet there to protect us, Israelis are asking, or is it there to stop us? Is it there to say to Iran, we're here, so don't do anything, and to say to Israel, we're here, so we're protecting you, so don't do anything in Iran. Which is it? We don't know in Israel. We don't know because the administration is still undermining Israel's right to defend itself. On the one hand, it puts its hand on its collective heart and says, we're with you, we won't let you be hurt, we are doing all this to show you that this we are with you. On the other hand, it is saying, well, you know, we oppose all violence on all sides. Really? Really? We call upon Israel to show restraint. Really? You want Israel to stop defending itself? It has pressured Israel to admit humanitarian aid into Gaza when we know it's going to be used by Hamas. We know that Hamas has fuel, electricity, and so on that it has filched from that aid for its own nefarious purposes. Will America, if it comes to the crunch, if the, if the Hezbollah start unleashing those missiles, will America come to Israel's aid? What exactly will it do? I mean, if we in Israel don't believe it because of what America has been doing, was doing until that terrible Saturday in empowering, funding, encouraging, and turning a blind eye to what Iran was doing, if we in Israel don't believe, therefore, that America will step up to the plate, why should America think that the supreme leader in Iran will think it? Deterrence is all about meaning it. If America has never meant it for the last several years, why should anyone think it means it now? Having said that, it may do. We don't know. And this is very frightening. So then the question that now must be asked 
is why these administrations, why these Democrat administrations are so keen to appease rather than fight and defeat tyranny. Well, one reason is the kumbaya mindset of the left, this belief that everyone is uh, susceptible to reason, susceptible to appeals of their self-interest, that all conflict can therefore be, achieved, be resolved by negotiation and conflict resolution, and you never need to go to war. They cannot get their heads around the idea of religious fanaticism and holy war that elevates death in the minds of these people to the highest goal of life. This belief by our liberal elites is a bottomless delusion. It is why the Obama and Biden administrations negotiated with the genocidal terrorists of Iran, why even now President Biden is insisting, quote, what comes next has to be a two-state solution, a path towards peace, close quote. This is the delusion that there are good Palestinians and bad Palestinians. The bad Palestinians, we now agree, Okay, we accept Hamas, they're bad. Okay, we agree, but the PA is different. The Palestinian Authority is different. These are the people who are entitled to a state. Well, the Palestinian Authority has the same aim as the Hamas, although their tactics are different. The Palestinian Authority wants the end of Israel. It teaches its children that their highest calling is to murder Jews and steal their land. And the role model of President Abbas is Hitler's ally in the Middle East in the 1930s, Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who promised Hitler that if he won the war, he, al that the, the Mufti would exterminate every Jew in the Middle East. This is the role model of the person to whom America, Britain, and the European Union are still trying to deliver a state of his own. A Palestine state would mean importing Gaza and that nightmare that we see there into the very heart of Israel. Jean Barkman, so much said in just four minutes by Melanie Phillips, a British Jewish woman. And she's brilliant. Everything that she said, I agree with. And I've had the thought that Israel isn't a child. They're an independent, sovereign nation. They've been attacked brutally in a second Holocaust. They have every right to defend themselves and eradicate an enemy. I've done a thorough search of international law. Israel has every right under international law to do what she's doing. She is not violating international law versus Hamas has violated international law. And these aren't innocent Palestinians. As I said, polling data says 80 to 90% of the people living there agree with Hamas. If you ask them, what is the thing that you're the most proud of in Gaza? It's the fact that we've created these terror organizations. And why is that? Because that's how they live. And we are the morons who fund it. So between the United States of America that gives perhaps $2 billion a year to keep this game going in Gaza with the Palestinian Authority, and then billions coming also from the European Union, what we see in Gaza is the biggest scam the world has ever seen, the biggest welfare scam. For 75 years, this has been going on. And so we fund this. And so you have the people, there's like three leaders at the top of Hamas. They all live in Qatar. You know what they're worth? They're worth $4 billion, $5 billion. So they skim off all the money for themselves. But what they really do is they hate Jews. That's what the industry is. Hate Jews, kill Jews, eventually we're going to win. That's what they see. And we're the ones who fund it. And the EU are the ones that fund it. And until we wake up, this is going to continue. So Barack Obama has zero knowledge of what's going on. I was sitting on Intel Committee, and I'll never forget it. Nobody knew it at the time. It's public knowledge now. But Iran was flat on its back, gasping for air. The Ayatollahs were about to go out of business. Barack Obama, on his own, without Congress, sends them a check for $4 billion to build up and strengthen the Ayatollahs. And then we all know what happened with the $150 billion and all the pallets of cash. And then he released about 27 people out of U.S. prisons to go back and rebuild their nuclear weapon program. What Barack Obama has done, and this is my opinion, nobody else's, it is treasonous against the United States. And I don't say that for partisan purposes. He did tremendous damage. What he did set us up for what happened on October 7th. Donald Trump came in. 
this was really a war of the bureaucracy, trying to sabotage Donald Trump at every corner. And then now Joe Biden is back. And so we're back in the pro-Iran business right. again, where he's lifted all the sanctions off of them. They had an extra $50 billion in oil revenue because the sanctions had been lifted. So the Biden administration, Barack Obama, our government has sent all the signals to Israel's enemies. We're for you. Melanie Phillips is right. We haven't been on Israel's side. We've been on Iran's side. What kind of lunacy is behind this? Do you have any insight from perhaps from your experience in Washington? Help my audience understand what kind of lunacy from not only the Western world, the leader of the free world, America, and our capital, Washington, D.C., becomes pro-Iran. Help us understand. Because here in this city of Washington, D.C., there are people who want to see Iran empowered, and they want to see Israel annihilated. When I was in Congress, the Ayatollah wrote a book, We Will Annihilate Israel in 25 Mm -hmm. Years. And it's been nine years since he wrote that book. They're serious. They have a plan. And there are people in Washington, D.C. who want to see that dream realized. Barack Obama, Iran couldn't have come up with a better president of the United States to serve them and to serve their interests. Now the same is true with Joe Biden. So if you look at all the personnel, we could do a show just on the personnel that Barack Obama put in place dealing with his Iran policy and Middle East policy. And now Joe Biden, the people who are in place calling the shots, you've got not only Iranian sympathizers, you've got people who are from Iran who are pro-Iran, who are in some of the most sensitive positions in the United States, in national security, in our State Department, in the Defense Department, in Homeland Security. They're the ones calling the shots. They're the ones who are in charge of our policy of who we let into the United States, what our national security priorities are. People who are pro-Iran, it's provable including the guy that Barack Obama had in charge of Middle East policy, who's now been suspended. And he was the number one pro-Iranian sympathizer. But apparently he was caught a couple of months ago passing classified information to Iran. Do you think maybe that fed into why we saw October 7th? Why aren't there hearings on that? Why aren't people screaming about all of these people who are in sensitive positions today in Washington, D.C.? Not one's been fired. They're still calling the shots. And still Israel has to fight against that. That's why as believers, we've got to pray for Israel because our own government is putting itself in a position of cursing, not blessing, because we are making decisions that are to Israel's detriment and to build up Iran whose goal is clear. It's the annihilation of the Jews. The Times of Israel, big headline here that I picked for the interview today, the Israel we knew died October 7th. The new nation will be scarred for generations. Again, folks, headline Times of Israel, the Israel we knew died on October 7th. The new nation will be scarred for generations. Now, Amir Tsarfati, my good friend, and Michelle's too, gave an update very recently. He didn't quote that, but He indicated that, indeed, he has been scarred for a long time because of the images and everything. Michelle, just four quick thoughts on that headline. Number one, I believe God will somehow work good out of evil. Number two, Christians are praying for Israel to rebound, obviously, but we need to pray that more Israelis are even open to the gospel. Number three, we need to be alert as to how all of this fits into eschatology or end-time events, and we've already referenced Iran. We know she's a major player in the end-time scenario, particularly Gog and Magog. And number four, I think we need to think about how can each listener contribute to the healing of that nation and that people. And folks, if you've seen the testimonies, particularly from family members, it's heart-wrenching. Your thoughts on that headline, Michelle? This is an opportunity for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ to educate ourselves, but also this next generation. That's what I've been focusing on since October 7th, because within hours of the brutal attacks, we went into a media war, a messaging war, and we're seeing that every day. And the war can be won or lost in a messaging war. And so young people are getting their knowledge and information from their phone on TikTok, Mm. which is controlled by communist China. 
So they're learning what a wonderful organization Hamas is and how evil Israel is. So this is a time to self-educate on Israel. But generally speaking, if people are 40 years of age and below, they don't have the background, Jan, that you and I did. When we came to Christ, we had a background. Our pastors were preaching on Israel at that time, and there hasn't been a strong emphasis. So we need to educate young people on Israel, but we also need to educate them on Islam. What are the basis of Islam? Young people are woefully ignorant, certainly age 40 and below, on what does Islam believe? What about Israel? Do they have a right to the land? Shame on us that we haven't been preaching this in our churches. So we need to have regular preaching on Israel to teach this generation under 40 because the Israeli government has to fight. I wish we had time just to lay out the military strategy. We held a conference at Regent on the military strategy. This is probably the worst situation Israel has ever had from a military strategic point. They have subterranean warfare that they have to deal with on their western shore. Plus, we've never seen a nation have to deal with war with this level of technology where literally every move you make is questioned and criticized. The world isn't looking at Ukraine and Russia They're not looking for the body counts up there. We don't see a hyper focus on every move that Ukraine and Russia is making. As we're seeing what Israel's having to deal with, we know there's 150,000 rockets in southern Lebanon pointed. And in Syria, that's a huge weapons cache because Iran comes up through Syria and then they resupply through Syria and then over and across through Lebanon. But also it is in Judea, Samaria where you've got 700,000 Jews. And so they are highly vulnerable. What is the Israel Defense Forces gonna do? And remember, you've got rockets coming in every day. They have to deal with rockets every day, ongoing terrorist attacks every single day. What about those 800,000 Jews in Samaria and Judea? Because every day you have terrorists with a knife going to kill a Jew, every day a gun to kill a Jew. Every day they're coming with a car to run over a Jew. Why? Because they're getting paid. In Gaza, the Hamas was getting $10,000 yeah. plus an apartment for every hostage they took captive. The same thing happens over in the Palestinian Authority. They get paid a lifetime salary for every Jew they kill. And the money comes from us. It comes out of the money right. we give them. So this is done. We passed a law, the Taylor Force a law, to outlaw this. Where's Joe Biden? Why is he giving them one dime? We have 31 Americans who were just killed and we have more that are hostages. Do you ever hear him say one thing about the 31 Americans who were killed? I've never seen their faces. I don't know what their names are. This is what we're dealing with. The Biden administration is off the rails because they're not looking out for American citizens who were killed and who are being held hostage, but also you have vulnerable Jews who are being targeted for murder every day, and we're paying the terrorist price. And so we need to call out to our elected officials to say, enough already. Stop paying for these Islamic supremacists. Stop being on their side, on Iran's side. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell. I have on the line Michelle Bachman, and we are trying to give a quick overview of really the last six weeks. Six weeks ago, a very fateful day happened. That was obviously October 7th. And as she and I have said many times, terrible demon was unleashed that day and our world will never be the same. I think that the end time clock is counting down even faster than it was before October 7th. Michelle, I want to go down a little bit different path here and we're running a little bit out of time, but play a quick clip. It happens to be Edwin Black, he's being interviewed by Jamie Glazov about tracking every single Jew in Boston. One thing maybe that might open some people's eyes as to how serious it's getting, there is a mapping project in the Boston area where Jews are being identified and Iran is behind this. I mean, this is mind-boggling. Tell us about this. The mapping project uh, was a a secret project that has been exposed as an Iranian operation uh, being uh, run through MIT. And it it identifies every Jewish person, institution, synagogue, company, 
organization in the greater Boston area. <laughs> and it's got it's got lines of connection to all, all of them. And just a few days ago, the complete database of Ashkenazi uh, of Ashkenazi Jews was stolen from 23 and, and me. And Iran is behind behind it. No one could shut down the server because it's run out of uh out of a Scandinavian country, mm -hmm. and they will not ob 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 obey the court mm -hmm. order. We don't know if there's five more, but this all ties in to Kristallnacht 2.0. This all ties into the rampage. Remember, when the Farhood took place, they painted the uh, they painted the Jewish homes with symbols so that the marauders could go to their homes. We've got this now, and people are afraid. Do I take the mezuzahs off? Look, I was in Texas last last week. I was in Don't Mess With Texas. And Texan Jews in Dallas were asking me, are there countries, are there countries who will accept Jews from Texas? Where am I? Am I in a Polish ghetto or am I in don't mess with Texas? I I I have a, another event in Dallas. I'm on the Glenn Beck show for uh for an hour and we're talking about it. Glenn and I are talking about it and I'm getting emails like this one from Christian people in Fort Wayne and Kentucky and other places saying we have basements to hide you in. We will hide you. And I'm saying, where am I? Am I in, in Anne Frank's Amsterdam? Edwin Black is the author of the book, which I read years ago, IBM and the Holocaust, being interviewed there by Jimmy Glazov. Michelle, this clip just blew me away. I saw it online, the video. Your thoughts on what we just heard? I agree with you. It is a blown away interview because what this is, Jan, this demonstrates that in America today and really in Europe today, we are Europe in the late 1930s. That's what we're living through. We're seeing things we never thought we would see before. But this is real. I didn't know this story that 23andMe had yeah. been stolen yeah. and that it was the list of Ashkenazi Jews. This is a mapping. Remember, it wasn't that long ago. In one week's time, our FBI director, Chris Ray warned us three yeah, times yeah. in a week in different hearings that we already have the enemy within, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas, Hezbollah. They're all here in the United States. Well, they've been here not just since last week. They've been here for a long, long time. So they have been operationalizing their plans, something I tried to alert people of years ago when I was on the Intelligence Committee. There's a foundational Muslim Brotherhood document that talks about there's a point called zero hour when they intend to attack and bring violence. Could that happen in the United States? Of course it could happen in the United States. That's why what we hear is that the United States could experience what Israel experienced on October 7th. So would that attack just be against Jews? Would it be against Jews supporters as well? I don't know. We don't know what that is. But we're living in a completely different time. That's right. That's why the hand of God is everything. Do we have God's hand over us? So if our nation is engaging in evil practices, we need to be following the Lord's will. We need to be under his protection. But I think biblically, you're going to see Jews more and more move to Israel. Yeah. And now that seems crazy after October 7th. I think they will be moving they because are, their are. government will mm -hmm. protect them. I want to just make a comment here, folks, about some online activity that's going on, some comments coming from some online broadcasters and others that Benjamin Netanyahu not only knew this event was going to take place, but he conveniently looked the other way. I'd encourage you to stop following people, and some of you know exactly who I'm talking about, and there are two or three, I'm not going to name them, Numbers of us are speaking out, stop following these people because that's lunacy. Now, number of us would be quick to say that Israel was certainly reckless. Matter of fact, they stopped listening to Hamas a year before. 
on the various radio channels that they had. They stopped listening to the chatter, other places that they were monitoring. So there was recklessness. I think there was carelessness. But when we start saying that Bibi Netanyahu looked the other way, let it happen, knew it was going to happen, this is lunacy. Others are speaking out, encouraging you. Kindly turn these voices off because they've lost their minds. Michelle, you want to comment at all? Israel has a lot of leftists in that country, too. Yeah. And a lot of the policies that Israel made were based upon demands from leftists. One were, we've got to give 20,000 work permits to Gazans because they're genuinely nice at heart. And so the Gazans came in and they mapped out where all the Jews lived. They knew all this data about them. And that intel helped them when they came the morning of October 7th. So a lot of these policies that were put into place actually weakened Israel and made them more vulnerable. That wasn't Benjamin Netanyahu who did that. And I second what you just said. I agree with you 100 percent. It is absolute veritable lunacy. I've even heard people say that Netanyahu worked with Trump and yes. they're the reason why this. I mean, it's nuts stuff. And Israel is expected to be perfect all the time. They have probably the most moral, humane levels of conducting warfare than any nation on earth. So enough of this. There is no wanton slaughter of civilians. They are trying to rescue hostages. And let's keep our mind on the main thing. Israel has to protect herself. And she's doing the dirty work to bring back the hostages, hostages of whom are from many, many countries, including the United States. So that's why we have to be vigilant in our prayers. This is serious business. Imagine if this was you in a tunnel or your child or your grandmother. We need to have some humanity here. This is a horrible thing that happened by demonic monsters. And so we have to have some humanity and skin in the game and keep praying and not be weary and well-doing, because this may take some time to get this figured out. We've got to stand with Israel, even if our president doesn't. Amen. Michelle, we now have a Bible-believing Christian as Speaker of the House, Representative Mike Johnson, and numbers of people, you and I included, are ecstatic over this. And of course, he's gone through some persecution for his faith, something you identify with as both of you evangelical Christians and that's just not tolerated in Washington, D.C. Give me your thoughts on Mike Johnson, new Speaker of the House, and how this all happened. He's taking great heat for his belief system, his Christian faith. You did as well. Mike is a great man. He is the genuine article of a godly man and godly husband and godly father. He's had his priorities right over life. I've known him for a long time, but I also work with someone who was Mike's mentor for 35 years. And Mike has walked the right line. He's a lawyer and he's made great decisions throughout his life. God sovereignly reached down and he blessed the United States of America. And when we had three weeks of chaos without a speaker of the house and pitching one candidate versus another, God sovereignly intervened and brought up Mike Johnson. Nobody thought he would be the speaker. He's been the perfect speaker. And the very first thing that he did is offer a prayer to Almighty God. He's been very clear about his faith. He understands that our nation is at a very difficult point. And so he hasn't put a foot wrong. Everything he's done so far has been right. He hasn't shrunk away. In fact, I was recently at the Capitol and they held a candlelight vigil, a prayer meeting, Democrats and Republicans, probably 200 on the steps praying for Israel with families of the hostages. I was so moved. You could sense the presence of God. That wouldn't have happened in the same way if Mike wouldn't have been there. They might have had some moment of silence on the House floor. This was the real deal. This was a prayer meeting. Scripture was involved. Prayers were said. And so I left that moment thinking this is something that had to please the Lord. We were standing and interceding for Israel. And it was about 200 Democrat and Republican members of Congress, nothing political, just about seeking God for his intervening hand for Israel. If members of Congress can do that, Democrats and Republicans together, surely churches can do that Amen. with the body of Christ. And many are not. I'm hearing from people right and left all day long. Their church is totally silent. It's been a terrible ordeal for a lot of people who put great faith in their church and they've been let down. That shouldn't be. Because every church should be holding a stand with Israel night. Remember, the number one character in the Bible is God. The second character is Israel. And why? 
because that's the nation God chose to fulfill his covenant because a Jewish Messiah to Jewish Mm -hmm. parents, but then to be the savior of the whole world. So we are grafted in as Gentiles. I thank God for the covenant, and I thank God for the Jewish state. If you know your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, all of this makes sense. If you don't know your Bible, then it makes no sense. So that should bring us to our knees, but also to search out the scriptures. Then all of this comes clear. How do you think all that we've talked about is going to affect our 2024 election? I've already played that clip of Melanie Phillips, the kumbaya of the left. They're going to want to get in and talk about peace and safety and, you know, what they're going to do as it concerns Israel and the two-state solution, which would be Israel's final solution, etc. But going back to our election a year from now, tell me how what's just happened might affect it. This is another disaster that's happened across the world, and it isn't just a temporary event. This is going to have reverberations. And so I think that the Jewish community is waking up. A lot of billionaires who are Jewish, for instance, have woke up and they're deciding I'm not gonna give donations here and I'm thinking differently. So I think this will have an impact on the election. But again, for me, elections now are about if the people are able to really vote the way that true American citizens, if they're able to vote, I think they are not going to choose Joe Biden. I don't think that's going to happen. But we could see a highly unpopular Joe Biden, one of the most unpopular presidents that we've ever had, be reelected. So it may very well be that Joe Biden gets pulled off the stage pretty soon. And Kamala Harris also has to get pulled off the stage. Believe it or not, she's more unpopular Mm -hmm. than Joe Biden. And a new candidate comes, and I actually think it's Michelle Obama. I don't think they have anyone. They talk about this Newsom. Newsom is hated in California. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he can be their candidate. I think it's Michelle Obama. And I think what they would do is a book tour. They'd have her go to different cities around the United States. She'd have Beyonce with her in one place, Jay-Z in another, Oprah in another. And so I think that's what she'd do. She'd basically do a book tour, have pre-screen questions she might take where she's sitting in a chair with three other people and they're giggling. I think that's what would pass for a presidential campaign. Just like we didn't have a real presidential campaign in 2020 when Joe Biden stayed in the basement. I think it would be probably a book tour for Michelle Obama. It wouldn't be about issues necessarily. It'd be about her. And then the question is, can she believably deliver that vote? I say no, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there who like her. And election went in that direction. Then we would continue with the insane pro-Iran strategy for another four years. Imagine the destruction with Iran empowered for another four years. Oh, I don't think we could recover. No. I don't think America could recover domestically. But again, I've always said this, a president can get domestic policy wrong and people suffer, but we can recover. But when you get foreign policy wrong, that may go on for eternity. And the United States clearly, since Barack Obama became president in 2008, we have gone horribly off the rails with foreign policy. And that's because of the decisions that were made regarding China. But really, number one, the decisions that have made to create a strong Iran. And Iran is a fierce, fire-breathing dragon in that region. And of course, you look at the convergence of events. When you have Iran working together with Russia, and they are, Russia is building all the nuclear power plants for Iran. You've got this lineup that's ongoing. Everything that scripture says, how these countries will be working with each other, those alignments are already there. They're strong. They've been activated. It's not like they just started these alignments, but it's fairly new. I mean, never before was there an alliance between Russia, Turkey, and Iran. That happened maybe six years ago when we first saw it. And that was shocking because that was a biblical alignment. Now... These are working relationships with each other. So you can see how these end time events can be pulled off because now they have working partnerships with each other. And Iran is a lot stronger than it was six years ago. Thanks to America, she's a lot stronger. Thanks to Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Yeah, and the dollars that have been sent, the billions and billions of dollars. Michelle Bachman, thank you for giving up time today to spend some time on Understanding the Times Radio. My audience so appreciates everything you have to offer, all the insights. Folks, I just want to make a comment going out of the program and cite a Bible verse, because the subject 
of God's faithfulness to Israel and his ongoing love for her affects every believer in Jesus. The matter sifts down to one audacious question, is God faithful and trustworthy or not? Either God is faithful to keep all of his covenants or he can't be trusted to keep any of them. If God has ceased to love Israel and has broken his covenant with the people he chose for his own, how can we trust his love for those who believe in Jesus the Messiah? If he changed his mind regarding Israel, how can we trust that he won't change his mind regarding believers today? The two verses I want to close with, Jeremiah 31, this is what the Lord says, he who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decries the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name, only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord. Will Israel ever cease from being a nation before me? Jeremiah 31, verses 35 and 36. Do you see the sun and the moon and the stars? Of course we do. And only if they vanish will Israel cease from being a special nation to God, to the very God of the universe, who created the sun and the moon and the stars and the nation of Israel. I want to thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. God knows what will happen tomorrow, next week, next year, the next decade. He says, I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. He tells us that he can be our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. And he asks that we must trust him as he orchestrates all things so that all that is predicted can fall into place. Yeah.